My grandfather coached here in McAllen and weekly somebody will come up to me, an older gentleman will come up to me and say, are you Coach Vela's grandson? And then they go on and tell me, you know, a story or something about the role that my grandfather played in his life and knowing that what he had done 20, 30 years ago for some of these gentlemen had paved maybe some little bit of pathway for them to excel. You know, my grandfather didn't care if they won or lost. He cared more about the men he was creating. And so coaching for me isn't about how much you can lift. It's not about podiums. To me, it's the connections that you make. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work with people from so many different backgrounds. And now I, I ask people to trade stories with me. Tell me your story. Let me get to know you a little bit more. You guys want the fans on? You let me know. You got an A written on the board for us to do, or the rep scheme that you've come up As an athlete in high school, there's purpose there for somebody like me. There's practices to show up to, there's teams to be on, there's coaches to get to know. And I had that consistently for a solid 18, 19 years of my life. And then you get to a university where it's a big school with a lot of people and I kind of hit a stagnant point where I didn't know if I had purpose. The alcohol abuse started very early. Like everything I do, I went in feet first. I was hyper-focused on social life. Those years for me is where I lost a little bit of myself. I was given an opportunity to move down to Cabo San Lucas when I was just about to graduate from college. My friend and his father invested into a sport fishing company and needed someone to head down there that knew the language, kind of a little bit about the culture. At that point, I didn't necessarily think I was running from anything. I think I was just really excited about that opportunity. Once I got to Cabo San Lucas, it gave me a little bit of a sense of purpose. But Cabo's a tourist town. Most folks have, have heard about it, and when they think of Cabo San Lucas, they think, I'm sure, Cabo Wabo, they think party, they think beautiful beaches, and it is. And the work life and my social life became a little bit blurry. I was away from home, didn't have a whole lot of people looking out for me. I was making new friends, but in a tourist town, you make a friend, they leave, it's kind of this revolving door of people that you meet, which is great for me. And on the downside, it's just a nonstop party. For a 21, 22 year old guy, I, I got away with it for a little while, and then it catches up. When you're offshore fishing, when the bite is on, it's chaos, and then it calms, and then you could be eight to 10 hours on a boat in the middle of the ocean, no cell phone service, no one really to talk to. And I found solace in that. I would go for days without communication with family, with friends, my boss. Most of my communication while I was in Mexico was funneled through my mom. Very surface level, tell everybody I said hi, tell everybody I love them. You know, and in my head I'm thinking, God, I just hope they don't find out how bad I'm doing. Once I moved to Mexico, the old habits kicked in. I drifted a little bit and was on a walk, clear the head kind of walk. I probably wasn't doing well. And I literally walked into a gym. I just walked in and I just watched. Recognized a lady in the class. She saw me there, saw me walk out, sent me a text saying, hey, why don't you come back tomorrow and try it? That did something there. And then Jason Kalipa came to town and he gave the speech of the health continuum. And when you're sick, well, and at your finest, right? And to me, that paradigm shift but I could only hold it for so long, and then I would lose it. If I got a workout in, I would feel good. I would kind of work out for three or four days, and then I would get lost in the sauce, so to speak. And then I knew that if I went back to CrossFit, I would get my mind right, my body would start feeling good again, but you know, I was still in that world of on-wagon, off-wagon, and I was trying really hard. I'll never forget that for sure. Here's this picture. There's that same His look. His boss right? reached out to me, and we knew that we either could figure this out or something was going to happen. It wasn't sustainable the way it was. And then God intervened and I tore my ACL and that required me to come home. I arrived in McAllen. My mother picked me up and drove me directly to our intervention. I knew Luis needed help and I didn't feel like I was the one that could give it. Each one of my family members had a chance to talk to me. My brother was very real with me. He's got two 
children and he didn't want me around his kids. It's hard to hear from a brother. It's hard to hear from a best friend. My sisters both talked about a light in my eye that was gone. Mom stayed quiet, mom doesn't have to say much, so moms have a special look in their eye. And I'll never forget her look. And I looked each one of my family members in the eye and I just made a promise to them. I said, I get it, it's, uh, the gig is up, I'll stop. Sonny came into my life. I don't know who was in worse shape. I found Sonny in a trash can in Mexico, and it was the day before I was moving all of my life back to Texas. And when I saw him, it was barely a dog. He was beat up, but he had a little bit of life in him. And I put him in my car, and just started driving. He drove for three or four days, and I would tell him, just please hang on. But I was kind of telling myself that too. And so it makes it really special because I think we've almost gone through recovery together. Watching him go from his broken self, trusting a stranger, and not giving up. And now he's my best friend. He heard me talk about it. <laughs> and that's Sonny for you. He knows exactly the role he plays in my life and he does it very well. After the intervention and coming home and the ACL surgery, 35 years old, laying on your mother's couch, that was a lot. And in the world of alcoholism and addiction, the way I stopped drinking for the first four years was what we call white knuckled. I didn't have a program. I didn't have steps that I was taking to be a better person. So it was still that emptiness and it was still that unawareness. I was sober, but I was almost just as unhappy. I was just as uncomfortable, even maybe more so. I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to what was going on in my head, self-care. There was zero self-awareness. I just didn't go there for, for a lot of years. And then COVID hit. And luckily, one of my best friends in town had an affiliate and gave me a key. And so I was able to go in there, start a little bit of my rehab for my knee, and just start moving. And a lot of it was done alone, and I think I needed that time and to just really figure stuff out, get myself tired, clear my head. The world had kind of stopped, which for me, COVID kind of served as a, a good point in my life, to stop and think, which I had never done, until I had to, really until it was time. I started recognizing that I was going through some really high highs and some really low lows. Thought I could work myself through it, just like I'd worked myself through a lot, at least in my head I was. But I woke up one morning and I knew that I had two options. And one was that option, that I would just make life easier for everybody around me by not being around. <clears throat> that I had done enough damage already. And I was tired, man. I was tired of being tired. It's hard. White knuckling's tough. And I felt alone. And I wasn't. I was surrounded by love. And I just didn't feel it. And I made a call. Thank God. I made a call to the gentleman that helped with our intervention. And that's where the recovery began. And I found that I did need other people to help me. I joined a 12-step program and I was committed to doing 90 meetings in 90 days and I was trying really, really hard. And then it just slowly got easier. I had intention, I had purpose, I had a promise I was holding. You know, I'm blessed with eight nieces and nephews. I didn't want them to see an uncle that wasn't who they wanted to be around. 
things get easier when you open your mind up to other people's suggestions, other people that have walked the path. The powerful thing about being in a recovery program is the people that you surround yourself with. And so through that recovery and the program and the community, that slowly opened my eyes to what CrossFit was really doing to me, unbeknownst to me. 12-step programs, you have sponsors. And I think in CrossFit, every member of the gym is my sponsor. I feel the same sense of, of community. I feel the same sense of love. And it's stronger here, I think, because of how we were raised, because we are so family-oriented, and because it's deep and sincere. I feel safe there, and that's important for me because I can be myself. My gym has been completely understanding of my journey. And if you can be open with yourself and then with the others around you in a CrossFit community, it's like me walking into that intervention. Everybody I was looking at wanted me to be better. I think it's a tool, what I've gone through, my experiences and what I've learned. And so to be able to give that back for me is, is the purpose. And at the end of the day, if I can help somebody out whether it's correcting them on a, on a snatch or whether it's talking to them after class about what's going on at home. The mental health and the physical health are equally as important. And I've found that in every community and every CrossFit gym that I've ever been to. Along with coaching CrossFit, I am the director of operations for a palm tree farm. And we've got 20 outstanding, hardworking individuals that keep all 600 acres. That's hard work. And to see it on a daily basis is a constant reminder of why I'm glad that I'm home. And I think God put that job into my life so that I could spend a lot of time in the CrossFit world helping others and then a job that fulfills me because there's so many people that have occupations that they're not happy with and there's not a day that I've driven to work that I have not been happy. You know when when hard storms and bad weather comes through the palm trees are, are one of the few things that can survive it and withstand all of that and to me that's powerful to me that's meaningful and I keep that in mind and so for me it's it feels good working out here feels good for me. I work for a small family and they've been nothing but good to me. They know my story, they support it. Going from one family at the CrossFit box to one family at, at Palm Gardens, Palm Tree Farm, you know, and then I have my family here. And so I'm just surrounded by an unbelievable support system here that I don't think I could have found anywhere else. And it's exactly where I, where I belong. I'm not the only person that suffered from a disease of alcoholism. I'm one of many. And my sob story doesn't compare to some other people's sob stories. I'm just lucky that there were people with a safety net that was a little bit higher for me. And I owe a lot of gratitude to them. And I carry that with me on the daily. And in hindsight, I think those are the people that I, I owe a lot of love to and I try giving that back to them now. What I pour out as a coach, what I pour out as a mentor, what I pour out as a friend, as a son, as an uncle. It's been a beautiful journey to be along this path that Luis has taken, always working hard at life, and that is such a beautiful lesson to learn from anyone, but from your son especially. I'm not a quick fix guy. I know that. In my life, I know that. If I was a quick fix guy, I would have been fixed when I was 21 years old and realized that I had a problem with alcohol. But it took a few bumps in the road. And the journey hasn't been easy. But as I progress as a coach, I realize that more and more now. And CrossFit has brought that out in me. The patience, being able to not necessarily mold an individual into what I want them to become, but just to help get that individual into what they want to become. So as a coach, I don't take my role lightly. 
I think some people may think I'm a little over the top when it comes to a coach because I do take it a little bit serious. But it's what I do, and I love it.